This is Live Well Talk on COVID-19 antibody testing. I'm Dr. Dustin Arnold, Chief Medical Officer at UNA Point Health St. Luke's Hospital. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Jonathan Newberry, pathologist with Cedar Valley Pathologist and St. Luke's Med Labs. In this episode, we're going to discuss the what is antibody testing, test results, and, and what they mean, and how, how is this going to influence the, the future of the pandemic and COVID-19 care as far as document immunity, et cetera. Dr. Well, Dr. Newberry, welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, first podcast, I think. It is my first. I, I appreciate the opportunity to highlight uh, an area of laboratory related care in the pandemic. Well, uh, you know, we don't let you out of the basement very often, but at least we're doing it today virtually. You're getting out of the basement. So that's come that up works. about twice a day for uh, food and water. Yeah. Well, you know, let, let's I get a lot of there. There is a, 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 a reoccurring question about antibody testing for COVID-19, um, particularly with vaccine mandates. People want to document their natural immunity, et cetera. So I want to get into that. But first, I really want to cover uh, for people that don't understand how integral the lab laboratory service have been during the pandemic. Um, I even personally, I, I, I never had any real relevancy to how microbiology itself is is more of an art than a science as far as the skills of those people performing those tests. Those are procedures being performed. They're not just technicians. You know, I mean, it's a, really a skill set and the lab has had to deal with so many supply issues uh, over the time, ongoing supply issues. And the, the lab really has been imperative to be part in discussions and moving forward, and they've done a great job. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how the lab has handled the pandemic uh, and what your experience has been? Yes, yeah, certainly. I would echo your uh, your commendations to the lab. They've done a really great job all along the way. Lab's role in the pandemic, as it usually is in, in most aspects of medical care, has, has been a little bit behind the scenes. Um, our, our main priority from the beginning really has just been to facilitate access and availability of the different types of COVID testing for, for the providers and the patients. And as you mentioned, this has been an incredible challenge at times, uh, not only due to the shortages of testing kits and supplies, particularly in the beginning, but uh, you know surges in testing demand at, at various points, including this recent uh, Delta surge. But yeah, COVID testing, as the listeners know, is, has obviously been an important piece of navigating the pandemic. Uh, whether it either be from a medical standpoint and just identifying new positive cases, uh, but also to guide treatment and quarantine as well as as provide opportunities for pre-procedure screening. And this has really allowed the hospital to be able to resume operations and continue to care for patients uh, in a way that minimizes risk. And, and certainly testing also uh, plays a strong role in like the public health standpoint just tracking the number of cases in our local area. You know, the lab tracks the numbers and types of cases of, of COVID testing performed, positivity rates, and we're, we're always accounting for the number of available testing resources we have on hand in order to, to make adjustments along the way to ensure that we can meet expectations and demands. So that's really laboratories, what laboratories role has been and, and what I see it to continue to be as this pandemic moves forward. Well, you know, and I, and I had some experience prior to the pandemic with uh, from a pharmacy side that, you know, I don't think a lot of people understand that you can only request supplies on what's called allocation. You can't just you and what and, and it, it is a good. It's a good process because it prevents people from hoarding things and and stockpiling items whether it's medicines or supplies so so i, I completely get it but I, I i don't think we were held to a previous allocation that wasn't relevant to the pandemic and so that slowed things down as well pharmacy side supply side as well and uh, i think we've done a good job of navigating that and i i think compliments to the the lab and lab leadership uh, you know, particularly Cassie down there. I mean, she is just amazing and is always innovative, trying to figure out what's the best way to do it. Um, sometimes those ancillary departments of the hospital, um, 
I think that we have all of them are good, but I think the lab truly understands that at the end of that, their work as a patient and they make decisions that way. You know, they 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 don't mm. they feel integrated into the delivery of healthcare, and I think that really reflects why they've been so successful. Certainly, I you know, as the medical director of of the lab, I am daily indebted to the layers of administrative and managerial support and leadership who really do a lot of the heavy lifting day to day and making sure that that uh, these services are seamless for our providers and patients. So certainly, yes, uh, they, they do a wonderful job and continue to, to work very hard. You know, we're 20 plus months into the pandemic. So, you know, certainly there are days where burnout is is a real thing. And I, I commend their resiliency and, um, you know, their their persistence and, and doing the right thing uh, for for the patients and the providers in this regard. Well, and, you know, you haven't been on the podcast before, but, you know, we, we refer to it as on the, on the podcast refer to it as pandemic fatigue because burnout to me, this is my definition. Burnout is you're doing the same thing you always did and it's just not emotionally satisfying anymore. Where this is something that we weren't doing and it just continues and it's really a fatigue. Uh, and so even the resiliency is even uh, more amazing, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. Um well, next question, what what are the different types of antibody testing? Uh, excuse me, different types of COVID-19 testing. Let's just let's just start with determining sure. someone positive negative. Uh, and also in that answer in hit on that you know, it, there is uh, some a skill set in collecting the test. Collecting right. the that, Yeah, that, so there's different types of COVID tests. Um, these tests either test for current infection or past infection. Uh, in order to test for a current infection, you're going to need a variety of viral tests. So the two main types of viral tests that are used, uh, the best and most reliable is a, is a nucleic acid amplification test. This is also known as a, a molecular or PCR-based test. I think most of the listeners by now have, have heard Heard about these, and this is really the the best and most sensitive um, form of viral testing to detect a current infection. You can also do things called antigen tests. These are typically more rapid, but slightly less sensitive form of testing, and just can't pick up a new active test quite as soon as a molecular based test. Um, a lot of people in the pandemic have had the opportunity to actually be collected for one of these tests by now. And certainly the collection piece is such an important aspect of this because we do have to get a swab fairly deep and into that nasopharynx in order to get enough of those cells in order to um, get a satisfactory evaluation. And one of the things that's been difficult and characterizing precisely how well these tests are performing. One of the, the, the variables here is the adequacy of, of test collection. And in fact, for a time and even now, the, the lab also has been uh, supporting a specimen acquisition clinic where uh, patients are scheduled by appointment to have their pre-procedural uh, uh, test screens uh, collected there. And this is been one of the ways that we can ensure good quality control on on how the tests are are being uh, collected. So that's to test for current infection, the, a viral test. Uh, to test for past infection, and this is the subject of the, the primary subject of today's podcast would be an antibody test. Uh, an antibody test does not test for the virus itself but rather test for your body's response to the infection. Uh, an, antib an antibody test could also tell you if a person has been vaccinated and subsequently developed antibodies to that. Um, so that's kind of the main uh, broad overview of the different types of COVID testing, uh, either to test for current infection with a viral test or, or past infection uh, with an antibody test. One other thing I want to touch on, just more of as informational, because I know the answer, I know you know the answer, that these tests don't come back within minutes. Uh, they have to be collected, sent to the lab, run on an instrument, 
and report it out. Um, and I think patients and physicians get uh, uh, flustered when it's not back instantaneously. Uh, and even as I think the turnaround time today was in the mid 20s, you know, we send tests out and it takes, you know, from time to collect a report is 20 hours. And uh, that that that's just something that I'd like people to, to understand. Um, and I don't know if you want to comment on that, Jonathan. I mean, it's kind of self yeah, sure. so, but, but But I want to get that out to people that this isn't, you know, if we, we could get it back in seconds, we would. Right. Uh, so turnaround time is always a priority uh, for us. The unfortunate reality is we just don't have a high enough throughput uh, instrument that can accommodate all the COVID testing that we're being required to perform in our area. Uh, I like to explain it. It's kind of like you have a certain size dishwasher. Uh, you're only going to be able to put X number of dishes through on, on one load uh, and try as we may to accommodate all the tests that we get. We only have a throughput of uh, a relatively limited number of COVID tests we can perform. You could even take the analogy a step farther if you think of those little detergent pods that you need to wash the dishes and, and pretend like those are actually test kits. We only have a limited number of test kits that we're allowed to receive for certain vendors. So what we have to do is kind of triage certain different uh, uh, populations of patients, our outpatient uh, uh, patients being one of those, our inpatients and emergency room being another, and we have pediatrics and we also have uh, OB as well as pre-procedural -pre screens for these tests. And really the end result is we have to be reliant on some of our larger affiliate labs in the system to perform some of this testing for us. Uh, currently our, our Viral COVID testing is going to Peoria, and as you mentioned, turnaround time typically is around 24 hours. The majority of this time is not uh, the actual time it takes to run run the test. It's um, the processing and handling of that specimen to get it on the courier to to uh, leave our area, actually go to the the different reference lab, be accession, and run on the analyzer. Most of the time, the actual analytical runtime of these tests is on the order of an hour or two, um, but uh, it's the, really the transit uh, time um, that accounts for the majority of the turnaround time here. The good yeah. news is actually our lab is bringing on a higher throughput analyzer in a matter of a few weeks, uh, and we're fairly confident we will be able to accommodate all of our local testing uh, for COVID within a month or so and uh, should the demand for covid testing die down the the great thing about this new analyzer that we're getting is we'll also be able to perform other types of testing on it so the equipment is is going to be utilized even if the demand for covid related testing dies down now I, this is a little inside baseball but you're refer referencing the panther that that's correct <laughs> right yeah I, I tell people, I say, look, it's about four hours. By the time they collect it, when it's run in-house, it's about four hours. Give, you know, don't don't be looking for that result within four hours. You know, give it at least four hours by the time they get down over it. And they're working as fast and as busy as they can. I, I think he, here's where people get um, get hung up or at least raise a legitimate question. That if we possess the antibody testing to study the vaccines, to confirm that an immune response had occurred, how can we don't have antibody testing to test natural immunity to the general public? Does that make sense? Does that, do you see yeah. what I'm coming to this? So, I, I mean, I, I understand on one hand you could say, well, we just don't have, because there are other illnesses that your antibody testing is kind of flipping a coin. You know, it's, they're, right. they're you, you know, I mean, we see that all the time. Um, I mean, you get people that have an IgG to something CMB that doesn't really mean they have CMB anytime remotely. You know, we we don't know, but right. so I think people get caught with how can the antibody testing is effective for one thing but not the other. Can you comment on that? 
Yeah, so it, it sort of ties into just the different types of antibody tests that exist. So, you know, there's there's two main types of antibody testing, you know, in the context of COVID. There's either a qualitative test. This is a type of test that will give you a yes or no answer, whether there's the presence of antibodies at all, or there's a quantitative test, or at least semi-quantitative test, and these are types that will give us a numerical value that establish how many antibodies that exist in our blood. Um, the unfortunate part about uh, COVID antibody testing is, you know, to, to for a quantitative test to really mean something, you have to rely on reference ranges of, an of antibodies. And with COVID-19, whatever number you get, it might be accurate, but the reference ranges really aren't that well characterized or, or understood at that point, since it's a relatively novel virus as compared to, say, measles or something that's been around for, for decades. And uh, so it's going to take some time until we really know what's, what's what. Uh, we, we really don't know how long immunity is going to last. Perhaps you do have antibodies and perhaps you are immune. But are those antibodies going to last one week or or one month or or years? And all that information just isn't quite yet known. Um, there's also some other aspects of our immune system that may play a role to different degrees depending on the person. Besides just antibody, you have different kind antibodies. You have other aspects of your immune system that can come to bat. So my army of antibodies may be enough for me, um, but they might not be enough for somebody else to fight off the infection satisfactorily if they if they're exposed. OK, I mean, that's you know, that that uh, that that uh, certainly is makes sense. I guess one of my things that I'm disappointed in that at a national health level is, I mean, we're the United States of America. We should have had some sort of antibody testing developed and confirmed uh, just from an epidemiology standpoint, just to see how this virus is, you know, and I, so I really feel that an opportunity was missed. Uh, and that's my own uh, personal opinion. Um, you know, we, we've been very resistant, if if not, you know, not accepting antibody testing when it's done for pre procedures, uh, just because we don't really know what it means. Right. Um, I mean, and, and I know sometimes that's frustrating to patients and clinicians, but you know, we, we, trust me, if we had an antibody test that would prevent us, that we could accept and prevent us from doing another test on you, we would. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no hands down, we would. Um, and uh, I, I think that's a great explanation uh, for, for that. Well, we'll continue discussing antibody testing in just one moment. But first, I want to tell listeners about a new segment on the podcast, The Mailbag. Uh, if you have a question about COVID-19, the latest technologies and procedures, services provided at UniPoint Health, or other medical topics, you can simply submit your question to me at unipoint.org backslash mailbag, and they may be answered on a future podcast. Please note the mailbag is not an alternative to a medical appointment, even though I do consider myself to be one of the smartest doctors in the world. But uh, any questions about personal symptoms or conditions need to be directed to your primary care a clinician or urgent care. In the case of an emergency, as always, uh, call 911 or go to your nearest emergency department. Once again, you can submit your questions to me at unipoint.org backslash mailbag. That's unipoint.org backslash mailbag, M-A-I-L-B-A-G. I look forward to hearing from you, our amazing listeners. Well, in, in closing, Dr. Newberry, um, I, I just want to give a shout out to the laboratory leadership during this time. Um, I mean, I, I, I've always been in a position where I've had a lot of good relationships and interactions with the lab, whether it's blood utilization, um, laboratory testing, laboratory uh, uh, protocols to, to put in place from the medical staff. So so it, it wasn't a huge surprise to me what a great group of people are down there. But I think the rest of the medical staff has got to uh, see that and, and understand the pride they take in their work and, and are really appreciative. So do you have any closing thoughts on the future of antibody testing. Do you think someday we'll have um, a test that will say, okay, here's your here's your quantitative uh, amount and you are immune? Do you think that's coming? 
Yeah, I hope so. I hope we begin to learn more about uh, truly what antibody testing means for the individual in terms of um, providing some kind of quantitative test that that really uh, gives some you know, the individual an opportunity to have a sense of security and a sense that they truly do have a layer of immunity there. Um, at the present time, I just don't think that exists in every situation. Um, the reality is, is antibody testing may not be that helpful for an individual at this point, because as we mentioned, we, we simply just don't quite have enough information to know to, what to do with these tests yet. Um, you know, I, I think what we'll see moving forward that the role of antibody testing will have importance, you know, kind of in the broader population uh, as we begin to learn better how to use them to assess the prevalence of, of immunity within certain communities. Uh, in other words, we'll begin to even better understand not only where the virus is, but where it, where it has been, and to try to use this information to, to respond to outbreaks, but also understand where, where new outbreaks may be likely to occur. Um, but as we kind of mentioned earlier, I think the biggest role of antibody testing presently is, would be the ongoing support of these vaccination trials. Uh, we have to learn how to use them to assess the effic the true efficacy of the vaccination. You know, a lot of the preliminary data from the vaccine trials uh, would, in fact, suggest that the vaccines are you know, uh, very effective. But because we we do have somewhat limited information, we we just can't make a firm. We don't have a firm grasp of how long they are effective for. So the antibody testing will continue to be a, a good resource just to monitor this duration of immunity. Um, furthermore, I think there were certain specific groups that weren't really ever included in some of these clinical trials uh, for the vaccine. Some of the elderly and immunosuppressed and, and some of the other groups that had certain pre-existing conditions or comorbidities. Um, so the use of antibody testing moving forward to monitor some of these subsets of patients is also going to be be important. Yeah. Pregnancy. Pregnancy is another group that a lot of these trials didn't have for obvious reasons. So, well, this is your first podcast and we hope to have you back. But one last question. Why why'd you choose pathology? That's a common closing question we ask all the guests. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I discovered that there were quite a few good reasons for me to choose pathology during during my training and medical school. Uh, I think it's true that most people tend to kind of gravitate towards those professions and work that they feel suit their or their personality and, and temperament. And uh, truth be told, a, a stereotypical pathologist is is fairly introverted and doesn't necessarily thrive off of uh, uh, running a clinic and face-to-face -face interaction with with patients or the, the types of stress that come with being in the operating room and if i'm honest i i do suppose i i fit that mold but i did still want a career in medicine and i was uh, very drawn to learning about you know basic sciences behind human illness and the, the study of different diseases uh, my dad was actually a pathologist and because of this i i think i was a little more intentionally observant to, to pathologists during my training uh, and, and medical school. And for the listeners who don't really entirely understand what a, what a pathologist does, I, I typically describe it as we're the doctors who uh, take a, a close look at any tissue that comes out of or off of your body. We, we generate a report and diagnosis and, and relay that information to your treating provider to help guide them in, in taking care of you. Um, and certainly we do oversee the clinical laboratories where, where blood work and other types of specimens are, are testing. You know, all in all, I do find the work uh, fulfilling and uh, I'm, I'm glad to be a part of this uh, good Unity Point team. Well, that's 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 a great, uh, great uh, description of the choice you made. And we're glad at least virtually we got you to come out of the basement where we, where we <laughs> keep you. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, I, I know you're busy, and I thank you so much for joining me today. Once again, that's Dr. Newberry. Uh, he is a pathologist here at uh, St. Luke's Cedar Rapids, part of Cedar Valley Pathologist, as well as St. Luke's Med Labs. For more information on all things COVID-19, visit unipoint.org. Thank you for having me.
Thank you for listening to Live Well Talk On. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your family, friends, neighbors, strangers about our podcast. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, be well.